connected and we are live. Welcome back to Mindful Social. This is the first chat that I've done in a little over a month. My voice is pretty much back and you know I'm raring to go. And I really am excited about having Kylie Slavic on the show this time because she's really got some great ideas. And it's all about you know driving traffic. And instead of thinking of driving traffic as push, 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 got to get the sale, got to get the sale, she's more about telling the story. And that buys right into what we believe about mindful social. So Kylie, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you for having me on, first of all. And thanks, everyone, for being here and listening to what we have to say about stories. Yeah, so, I, so I've so i been behind the scenes of some really big coaching and internet marketing brands for the last seven years, probably most notably the Gina DeVee coaching company. But I've, I've worked with everyone from Kendall Summerhawk to Max Simon, just a lot of, so I've pretty much done everything there is to do in internet marketing, except for the tech. I've done copy, I've done, you know, traffic, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, putting funnels together, conversion optimization, all that sort of geeky stuff. And what I, and, and I also managed a lot of launches and a lot of affiliate programs as well. And what I discovered, because usually what would happen in these companies is that I would be put into a teaching role as well with the clients and people couldn't duplicate what I was doing mm. until I started to teach the story aspect and how that I'll tell you a little bit about how that happened. And then, you know, we'll just talk about whatever you feel like people need to hear about today. But I, I, I managed a launch with one of those companies and we created a, a funnel that everybody, a lot of the big time gurus thought was a little funky and they, they were like, eh, you know, <laughs> like nobody's it's not how we do things. Yeah, like, like <laughs> nobody's going to watch that many videos and they're too long and blah, blah, but never underestimate the power of like women doing things the, the way they want to do it. Right. And not following any template or, you know, formula. So this was primarily a female audience and they loved every minute of every video. It was the launch, probably the launch sequence probably had over two hours of video and the statistics oh. showed us that people were really watching it. It was crazy. Anyways, we ended up doing $2.5 million in sales and in, in that launch in a way that everybody said was crazy. And as far as I know, for women's coaching, that was definitely one of the biggest launches in, in our industry. And I did some market research. I was running the Facebook ads and running the affiliate program. So I was, I, I did all the lead gen for that entire launch. And basically I was just telling stories with the ads. I had no idea how to do Facebook ads. And when I look at my screenshots of the statistics from back then, I'm like, I look at the stats and I'm like, it's so clear that I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but we were, we were making $10,000 sales to cold traffic. Like it was nothing. It was crazy. Mm. And so I reverse engineered it and I realized, okay, what I did with this ad copy was I wrote really long stories. And then on the back end, she told really long stories. And I did some market research to reverse engineer why did we get these results. And nine women out of 10 told me we didn't care about the product, we didn't care about the program. We really saw ourselves in the story and we wanted to be a part of it. And those were like, I had already suspected that, but that was just verbatim what, what we discovered. And so that's, so I've done everything there, there is to do in online marketing, but the tech, but that's why story is the only thing that I'm teaching these days. Um, I, I had the best results from it personally, and people duplicate the best from it as well. Mm. So those longer video sets are becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're seeing people doing longer videos where in the past it was really, hey, keep that video short because nobody cares what you say. Mm -hmm. and was that because nobody cared what you said, literally, that your story wasn't getting across enough that people would stick around for it? And that when you actually have a really great story, they'll stick around for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you brought that point up. And the funniest thing happened this week. I, I sent out an email to my list with 
talking about sort of a similar thing about how you really need to be telling your story and this is why. And this guy who's like a long time internet marketer, very, very much more successful than me, wrote back and said, you know, you're, you have a good personality and you're kind of pretty. So do you think it only works for you? Or do you think, do you think anybody can tell their story? And I was like, mm. I was like, here's the thing. Here's the, th I, I was like, thanks for the compliment, but here's the thing. <laughs> the story is never about me. It's always about you. If I make the mistake of thinking the story is about me, then I've lost the opportunity. And I've re right. I've recently been really pounding this point because when I started teaching story a lot, like I have a lot of free materials. And so if people aren't actually working with me in that one-on-one -on -one capacity, then they might take something out of context because I do have a lot of free story courses floating around out there. And so a lot of times the people that don't work with me one-on-one, -on -one, but, they, but they get their hands on some of the material, they'll come to me and say, you know, you said, tell your story and it would work and it didn't. And so, like, so I usually say, well, let me see what you put out there and then I'll see it. And I say to them, look, like that's for your therapist. That's for like girls, <laughs> like that's for like girls night at the bowling alley with some beer, you know, like this, isn't, mm. this isn't what you, this isn't business storytelling at all. And, and how I make that distinction is that, most people understand this idea that we need to be vulnerable in our storytelling, but that's not it. Like that's not where you stop. That's one piece of it. That's important, you know, empathy, vulnerability, but the most effective way to tell stories are really thinking about what your audience is struggling with and, and how can your stories act as a coach to coach them through those problems into making empowered decisions for themselves. Now that's how the selling happens. People, people mm -hmm. buy because they realize that, and this is actually, this idea is something that was first introduced to me by a book called winning the story wars, which changed everything about my business life. And, and what he says is that people should buy from you because they think that through buying, they are engaging with their higher level values. Mm, their higher level personal value. Right. And, and mm. so how you do that is you use your story as an opportunity to, to share those values, to coach people through their fears, their objections. And, and so I'll, I'll give you an example I, of what it means for the story not to be about me, but to be about my audience. And because that's just something that I'm, this is like one of the things I'm really, really talking about a lot right now. I... I did a webinar one time and I was sharing about that Facebook ads campaign. And I, and I said to them, look, I've generated millions of dollars from my story-based Facebook ads, but here's the thing. The first time that I made a Facebook ad, I didn't know how to resize an image. And I was crying because every time I'm very untechy, like plugging in the computer, you know, my mom will be like, don't forget to shut down your computer kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, why? I have so many files open, you know, like, so I, so it's a funny thing that I own this online business because I will literally go, you know, I need this app. What do I do? Like I'm that girl. right? So, like, so I, so I shared the story on a webinar and I was like, I didn't know how to resize a photo. Writing the copy was no problem for me because I know how to connect with people really deeply. Mm -hmm. Resizing the photo was like, like a meltdown and getting it to be just the right size for the ad for the right hand column and the newsfeed and all these different things. And then, and then I found out the hard way my first week of doing Facebook ads that, that you can't save your work. So you can't just walk away and go on a walk and come back an hour later. Cause it won't be there. And so I was like, Oh, no. So I so I was learning all this on the job, and and then mm -hmm. that same week we were able to turn five hundred and seventy five dollars into sixty seven thousand five hundred dollars. My first campaign, and it was like a two week thing. I think we were spending fifty dollars a day, so 10, 10, 11 days. And mm -hmm. and I do have a screenshot in case anyone's rolling their eyes and falling off their chair right now. I I mean that really did happen, and I had no idea that that was abnormal because I had no idea what I was doing. You know. <laughs> I was just like, so anyways, I, sh I share this idea, not because 
it means anything to me. It does. I don't even think about that time in my life anymore. But more people told me that they bought my program, which wasn't even a Facebook ads program. It was a launch program. More people told me that they bought that program because of that story, because that story was in service to my audience. It was very strategically placed there for people who feel like I can't do this. Mm-hmm. Because of a girl who can't even download an app onto her phone without pulling some of these hairs out of my head can can make money with Facebook ads. Anyone can do it, right? And a lot of people try to tell that story like, oh, if I can do it, you can do it. You know, a construction worker from Detroit, like we hear that stuff a lot. That's not enough. Like they need to know your failures. They need to know what was against you. Like what what, what were the odds that were not in your favor? Mm -hmm. Um, because it gives it, because when we think about what is our audience belief system, it's that if you have a certain level of success, it can't be replicated. It's special. It's this, it's that. And, and I, and I use that sort to show them. In fact, um, if my computer breaks, I just buy another one, you know, like, like, I'm not. So you're a digital digital marketer, but you're not a geek is what the story is. Oh, I'm a geek in other ways. Like I will optimize funnels Mm. where other people would just go, Oh my God, could you leave that alone? Like I will geek out on one word in the copy and, and like, I will geek out in the right brain things, but the left brain things, I'm just like, ah, so it's, but it's the idea that like, I, I, I can manage a successful launch. I can launch my own programs. I can run really great Facebook ad campaigns without really being able to even, you know, troubleshoot a computer problem or resize a photo. And so that became a really important thing for my audience. And it was really about them and not me because I don't care about that. Whereas sometimes people feel like I need to share about this break up, you know, because I'm in the love niche, but they're still crying about it. And I'm like, you need not share about that because that's about you and that's coming from a need that you have that you're wanting your audience to have a certain experience but it's really about you talk about if you're a love coach and you want to talk about the breakup because you want you want to help other people talk about the one that happened 15 years ago you know the Mm -hmm. one that you don't even care about that you're like who's that if you saw them in the grocery store you're like who is that you know like do i know this person (laughs) like that's the that's when you want to tell that story so i don't know if that's helpful to anybody but i have noticed the biggest mistake i see especially women. I do not see this with my men clients as much, but with the women, they're just like, Oh, I want to go really deep, really fast. And I was sharing with somebody yesterday. That's kind of like going to the bar and saying, let's get married instead of like, Hey, I'm Kylie. What do you do? Like, who are you? What are you about? And really finding out about them first. It's, Mm -hmm. it's like moving too fast. So it sounds to me like some of the things that you're tying into is actually the viewer's compassion for you Mm -hmm. as much as your compassion for their, their issues. I think it's, it should be a little bit unbalanced in their favor. You know, like it really should be Mm -hmm. about them. And then we use our own life stories as a way to relate to where they're at. Mm -hmm. Cause then it makes Mm -hmm. it, it also takes the pressure off of them. You're not going like, Oh, you know, you're dumb and you're, you know, like, like when you identify people's pain points, you don't have to go like, oh yeah, you know, you've been trying to diet for 30 years and it's not working for you. Like you say like, you know, I really struggled with diet, yo-yo dieting for 30 years and here's where I finally had the breakthrough and here's what's happening in my life now. And now they're like, oh, okay, I'm not alone. You know, whereas Mm -hmm. the direct Mm -hmm. response approach is usually like, let's agitate the crap out of their pain and make them feel so bad about themselves that by the end of the sales letter, they have nothing else to do, but to, um, but to buy, right. That's the essence. Like that's, that's my negative slanted essence, I guess, of what I feel like direct response is, but the story approach, which is oftentimes called empowerment marketing, it's really about, being willing to be vulnerable, being willing to share things about yourself so that other people feel empowered to take uh, to take the action 
that they need to take, assuming that your offer is something that can help them in, a, in an authentic way. So I see a question mm -hmm. that, that came in and it says, uh, it's Mitch, any tips for sharing a powerful story on Facebook or some of the other platforms? Absolutely. It's the same thing. If you're, if you're just kind of starting out, there's, there's two, there's a lot of like really deep and really complex story stuff that I teach people that comes from depth psychology and Hollywood and all this stuff. But if you just want kind of like the quick and dirty version and I, and I did nothing but this for over a year and it really worked is there's two story formats that you can kind of keep short ish. So they would be great for Facebook, LinkedIn, any kind of video sharing, I guess for Twitter, probably not so much, but for basically every other platform. And the mm -hmm. first one is, is that basic before after. But we don't want to do it in the way that a lot of people have been doing it, which is like, you know, before I was so broke that, you know, the bill collectors were calling everyone in my family and, and now I'm on an island with tequila <laughs> and the money is coming in while I, you know, have this harem in, in, a, in a blow up boat or whatever. Like that's not what people really care about. And, and it's also, it's, it's, Icky. It's, it's just gross. We're not gonna do so. <laughs> the father of modern advertising, uh, his name is I think it's John Powell, John something. He um, I know that's that's a little obscure, John something. I think it is John Powers or John Powell. He said he used to write these ads, and they said it was like 1910, and the ads would say neckties five dollars. They're nothing great, but at least they're cheap. And he would, and he would, but he would sell them out, like because it was real. Exactly, and so the mm -hmm. the people who I think he was advertising for like Woolworths in like 1910, and the people were just really frustrated with him as a copywriter because they were thinking, you know, this makes us look so bad. But the thing is, every ad he wrote turned to gold. So they kept hiring him and he made those companies what they what they were for so long and they called him honest john and and so that's the first thing is your story needs to be really true you don't have to say you know my service my service isn't that great but at least it's something i mean we don't have to do what john was doing mm -hmm. but the thing is we want to use real true details that are believable from our own lives so the the process would be Think about what your audience is struggling with. Go a little bit deeper than you ever have before. Like if they tell you I'm struggling with money, what does that really mean? We're not mm. gonna tell before after stories about money because it's kind of shallow and people are sick of it. But if what you discover is that what they really want is to feel empowered or they wanna feel good about themselves or they want to feel free or they don't wanna feel controlled, right? You find out what that sort of desire under the desire is and you write a story about when you were, the before after is, you know, there was a time where I really didn't feel free. This was happening, this was happening, and this was happening. Here's the breakthrough or the pivot point or here's what changed and here's what's happening now. And that would be the most basic way to share your story on a Facebook post. Uh, hopefully mm -hmm. that makes sense and, and please feel free to ask any sort of follow-up questions. The other the other story that I think is super important, and um, there's an entire book that validates with research how I was already feeling about this, and it's Evolved Enterprise by Yannick Silver. And he talks a lot about how more and more and more, even in product sales, people are really putting their money where their values are mm. at an increasing rate. And maybe, maybe their values that doesn't always mean like fluffy bunnies, right? I mean, for me, it kind of does. Like I want to save the rainforest and all that kind of stuff and, and, and clean up the ocean. So for me, that would mean I'm buying my, you know, uh, that's where I'm throwing my money. That's where I'm casting my dollar vote. For other people, it might be about something that I really disagree with. Maybe they really believe in war. And so they're, they're you know, they're doing that. But the point is, is that consumer research is showing that people are, are purchasing more and more based off of their values. And so what happens is that if you have, let's say you're a financial planning service and then there's a million other financial planning services, well, somebody with a Christian you know, background is probably gonna buy financial services from somebody who shares their 
their values. And if you're a Christian and you don't share that and you don't share, you know, that you have a certain belief system or you have a certain why or you have a certain value system in your business, then you're losing out on all those people that would connect with you immediately. And so it's not just about religion. It's really people congregate around and purchase based on a set of shared values. And so for me, I put my social values in the forefront of my marketing. And when I look at my group programs, I, every single person in there has some sense of, I want to change the world. I want to do good. I want to contribute. There's nobody in my classes or on my client list that just wants to make more money to make more money. And I don't want to work with them and they don't want to work with me. And I do want to work with people that actually want to want to make a positive impact. So that becomes a part of my storytelling. So the idea behind what I'm saying is that if you're going to tell a quick story on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or LinkedIn, sharing a story about your why can can bring clients in, especially if you're not trying to do that. And you're just like, oh, it's great that I you know, sold all these high ticket packages this week because I was able to give, you know, $10,000 to the politician that I'm supporting, or I was able to give $10,000 to the cause that I'm supporting, or even showing pictures of yourself at something that you really believe in. And maybe it's not deep, like maybe you just love a certain basketball team, maybe you love, you know, but, but but those types of story elements go a long way with the people who believe and feel like you do. And this also brings in the element of visual storytelling. You know, if your people love freedom, you should take pictures of doing things that are an expression of your freedom. And you can, that can tell a story more powerfully often than anything you can say with words. Isn't it kind of a, a concept of you really want to, and let's, let's say, for example, you're a coach that you really want to build a tribe of people who have similar values to you or similar interests, because then you can speak naturally. You can be yourself. You don't have to put on some kind of a, a hat to really market to them. It's really, we're all part of the same tribe. We're all going for the same ideals, maybe not every single one of them, but it sure makes it a lot easier to be consistent with the content that you're putting out and your messaging and really relating to people as opposed to marketing at them, which is one of my big. Well, yeah, messages. nobody wants to be marketed at, right? Mm. And I think, again, that book, The Story War, Winning the Story Wars, if you really want to get into story, anyone listening, I really recommend that that's where you start with that book. He talks so much about that. And in fact, that is, in a sense, why story works so well, because he talked about how for hundreds and thousands of years, humans shared ideas and shared values and shared teachings through story. And what mm -hmm. actually interrupted that was advertising, interruption advertising. And that interrupted our entire way of communicating and so for the last 100 years, we've been told what to think. He calls it the broadcast era. We've been told what to think by advertisers and politicians and, and media and, you know, the people that own all those companies. And it's disrupted our ability to create culture and contribute to culture in the way that we used to. And he said when social media came into play, it kind of gave that power back to people. Now everybody is a storyteller. Now everybody has the, the possibility of, of basically getting their message in front of the right people. And so the old way of, of advertising is losing its potency. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to be told what to think anymore. Now that we are empowered again to kind of do you know, to share information in the way that we want to. Again, nobody's paying attention to all that other stuff. I mean, some people are, but most, you know, a lot of people aren't. And, and, and the other thing I'd love to say about that is that there's 5,000, the average person ignores 5,000 marketing messages every single day. So, <laughs> yeah. So if you don't, if you don't share the value of who you are and what you have to offer through sharing those before after sharing your why sharing your values, sharing your experience your heart 
and using that as a as a coach to coach people through their issues your message isn't really going to be relevant and i think you know i i was talking to a couple of people about this recently who are are much more expert in story for business than i am and as far as what they can tell people who who don't brands who don't embrace this won't even be able to have a business in two to five years mm. and you know one of my friends who is a, a very accomplished business person he's doing story marketing for nasa and google so you know to me if if nasa has money in their budget for storytelling about their brand then us solopreneurs who it's already so much harder for us to get our message across and cut through the noise we, we probably want to pay attention to that mm. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting you bring up the solopreneurship because I think that it's easier for us in some respects to tell an authentic story and really be ourselves. But then when it comes to, you know, part of my business is marketing for brands. And so when you're trying to tell the brand story in that human approachable way, it can be very challenging because the brand doesn't want to be represented as a human. Mm -hmm. uh, very often, they there's so much pushback. There are so few brands that really get how to connect with the people that they want to do business with. Um, partly because I think, and the small businesses do this too, it's like, well, everybody wants our product. So they don't talk to the person. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about you know, how you define who your market is mm -hmm. um, and what they want. What kind of tools, for example, could people use to really get those data points before they start thinking about um, marketing to them? I am really, really big on market research. And that's what I do. And in fact, I was just in a business meeting this morning with, with someone doing a new startup and it's more in the physical product space. So I have no experience in that. And the, and the consultant was saying the same thing that I tell my clients who are coaches and consultants primarily, which is you need to do what I would call sort of customer client avatar research. You need to sit down with five of your ideal clients and you need to ask them, 20, 30 questions about, you know, and I have process for the processes for this, but ultimately it's getting down to what are their spending behaviors? What are their values? What's important to them? Where do they go on a Friday night? What do they eat? Where do they shop? Um, what kind of Facebook groups are they in? Who are some of the other coaches they've had? What are they, what is their vision for one year, five years, 10 years? What are their pain points? What's stopping them from getting there? How can you help them? I even have people ask, like, would you invest this much money to get these problems solved? And would you invest it with me? You know, it's good to know. And then, you know, I have my clients do five to 10 of those. The guy this morning suggested 100. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot. But he's also, he's he, he also said that that's the process that tech startups use. If they, you know, when they have a great idea for an app or a new program or whatever, they will, they consider, and he said it's called the lean startup method, which I haven't had mm -hmm. a chance to look into yet, but he said that a hundred interviews or a hundred, a hundred people will usually give you enough data points. If you're a coach, I think five to 10 would, would give you enough. And you just sit down and you ask them. And if you, in, in to backtrack, cause you even had said what, it, you know, if you don't even know who your ideal client is, then I think if you're not even ready to go out and talk to them, how to discover who they are is really to think about what what it, what are your unique strengths, what are your unique gifts, what are your unique talents, and what problems do you like to solve? And and even beyond problems like, all right, if I have a headache, I'll create aspirin or whatever. It's it's also what transformation really excites you. Like, do you like mm -hmm. seeing people go from depressed to really energized? Or do you like seeing people go from having really superficial relationships to having intimacy and connection? You know, like what excites you and then what can you really bring to that process? And then you start to construct your ideal client from there. Mm. That's a really, I, I like that process a lot. It's, it's more, I, I do create personas a lot. 
um, you know, but really understanding more about the personas than just the basics. I can't imagine doing a hundred questions unless it was in an, you know, an interview kind of situation, mm -hmm. because in a lot of, you can't send somebody here, do my hundred question survey. It ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think, you know, what we've done sometimes in the past is going out to the sales team when you're trying to redo how people market, go out to the sales team and ask them the hundred questions. You know, who are your clients? Who's buying? Why do they give a shit about your product? You know, what is it that moves them? And then kind of expanding from there and finding out more about who those people are. Absolutely. And I just want to correct myself. It's, he didn't say ask a hundred questions. He said, ask a hundred people. Oh, okay. so maybe it's 20 questions, but that's a lot of people for the average person mm -hmm. to encounter with. And so for me, I usually tell people five to 10 is enough. If you're in what I like to call sort of the information transformation industry, I, I have found that five to 10 interviews is enough to see really clear, distinct patterns in people's behaviors and people's mm -hmm. what's inspiring and motivating people. That may be because you're better at analyzing it than the average person too. I think I think that is in itself is a skill. Looking at those personas, well, but it is looking at those those personas and being able to pull out tangible content mm -hmm. as opposed to. I, I think a lot of times personas tend to be very um, literal, where you know they're looking at them as data points and not that kind of human perspective. There's not a lot of compassion for who those people are or how you solve their problems. They think more about how can I market to them? What do they want? You know, if they like the color blue, we're going to make our website blue. <laughs> that's not really compassion, people. That's that's not going to work. Orange makes people eat more, hence Burger King and McDonald's. No. <laughs> or Food trays in the, in the college. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm not. So I, I totally believe demographics has an important place in advertising, but I actually like for people to go deeper. And I, I call it psychographics and spiritual graphics. And when people work with me, I do this whole system of, of archetypes and we really look at what are the unconscious motivators that people are, mm. that's driving behavior and how can we actually empower people through understanding that. So my process goes a lot deeper than I think a lot of people are willing to deal with, but, but it's very, but then I can sit down and create an entire marketing campaign in literally five minutes because if you know somebody that well, and I use this metaphor a lot, if you sit down to have dinner with somebody, you always know what to say to them in a conversation. It's not like you have to sit there and get out the whiteboard and, you know, like, like make a graph and do all this and then split test, right? Because you know who you're talking to, so you know what to say. Mm. And I think it's the same thing with marketing campaigns. When you do a lot of story work and you start to really deeply understand who you're talking to and what stories they need to hear to be empowered, you can crank out an entire sales page speaking it out in five minutes. That's the key though. You've said empowered several times today. And, and I think that's the key is that instead of, you know, when you're, you're creating your marketing, you want to think about how can I'm, I empower this person rather than how can I get them to buy what I want them to. How can I freak them out? Very different. I've been in copy groups before that I had to leave because they were literally talking about how if you agitate the pain enough and make them feel inadequate enough, then just purchasing your program or your product will alleviate the pain and they, and they don't mm -hmm. even have to interact with the product. And I yeah. was like horrified. I mean, that just really made me want to reach the throw out bucket. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, are you serious? And I understand that trillions of dollars have been made by that. And I also understand that people are making millions of dollars, maybe not billions quite yet, but millions of dollars by, by sharing in a different way. And I think it's mm -hmm. only going, I think that, I think that we're seeing a trend towards that. And I think, more and more and more, it's only going to be increasing in terms of having to have empowering conversations with our clients and customers. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that, you know, marketing has changed in such a big way. And I was in an event not long ago that, um, 
you know, they had put on this free event and it was, you know, supposed to be an empowering and enriching and wonderful. And in some ways it was, but they spent the entire event really leading up to the sale, at which point they trotted out a bunch of people with testimonials on stage who talked about how empowered and wonderful they felt. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't done in such a way that we felt empowered. Mm -hmm. It was, oh, this is the same, I, you know, and, and because I'm a marketer, I was waiting for the pitch mm -hmm. and I knew it was coming. But the way that it was phrased was so off putting mm -hmm. that a lot of people got up and left mm -hmm. and they had spent all of this money, all this time building up and creating this tribe feeling with lots of interaction and, you know, lots of things going on but then they dropped the ball at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was really fascinating to watch. Um, I think one of, one of the things that I love to do is look to see what other people's processes are and how they do that lead up. And I think there's a lot of people that, um, you know, they are, as you said, going to, I know your pain. And then they twist the fork in your back to make it hurt just a little bit more. And then they tell you that they've made millions of dollars and you can too, if you buy their millions of dollars program. <laughs> and it's a that's kind of in the middle of the really old school. And, you know, people who I think have an old school mindset and are trying to have a more uh, compassionate, more, more meaningful relationship, but they don't know how to get there. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up. I, I have a story mastermind that I, that I taught and I was really discovering the process as the mastermind was unfolding. And what I did, like, I usually create a story arc with people so that from the very first ad that we, that we put out there, all the way to the opt-in page, to the emails, to the sales process, whether it's a phone call or a sales page, your story, and all the way, actually all the way through program delivery and then all the way to the upsell, mm -hmm. your story is consistent. So it's not like, okay, we're trying to hit this pain point here and now we're doing this over here. It's like, no, there's a narrative happening here. And I call it the story funnel. And that's the process that I work with over and over again. And so I create this story arc and in the first time that I did the story mastermind, what I discovered is that I use the hero's journey story structure in my story funnels and in my story marketing over and over again. And what I, I actually discovered which phase of the hero's journey your offer should be. And so, so now you're, so when I was making my curriculum for my mastermind, I called it your offer as the solution in the story arc. So it becomes this really seamless, like, like someone's just reading the next chapter. And mm. there's a way that you could do that in a live event where people would feel really good about it. And they would go like, yeah, of course I want to take the next step with you. Duh. You know, like you've given me all this value and you've made me sort of like the hero in my own story. Of course I want to continue. And so there's ways that we can do that in a marketing campaign where by the time someone sees the offer, they're just like, of course. Mm. And I have never had a sales conversation in my life really. Like I just put out content that empowers people. And when they get on the phone with me, they're ready to buy. It's just a matter of what do they want to buy and when do they want to start. And sometimes it's not right then, sometimes it's later. But but usually the common thing, I, I don't do a lot of videos. I don't do a lot of webinars. I don't do a lot of video series. I don't even do a lot of active list building. What I do is I, I create content mostly written and it's so about my audience and so about who they are and so about what they really need in their life to move forward that usually I just have people coming to me saying, what, how can I work with you? Mm. And, and really almost 98, probably 95% of my selling happens through just storytelling in my emails to my list. And I don't have to, I don't have to invite them to come to 90 minutes of their life for a bad sales pitch on a webinar. I'm just like telling them stories, telling them stories, telling them stories. And then I'm like, Oh, and by the way, I'm doing this thing. If you want to be a part of it, you know, mm -hmm. and then they do <laughs> because I'm not like, I call it, Jonah Sachs calls it inadequacy marketing. I call it adrenal pulling marketing. 
And like, I don't do that to people. I don't freak them out and make them feel bad, you know, and I don't think anyone should do that, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there is, there's a lot of it out there and, you know, it's interesting to see how some people build their stories and you're waiting for the pitch. I mean, who sits through webinars, you know, where it all starts out so great and then you get through very little value to the pitch. Exactly. And all you end up is pissed off. At least that's me. No, no. <laughs> I end up pissed off. Yeah. Um, no. Can you talk a little bit about how you build that story arc? Is that what kind of process do people go through to build that story arc? Well, I start with what's called the moral of the story. And what happens with that is you basically want to find sort of the punchline of your brand. And in the sense of Nike's moral of the story is with a little bit of hard work and determination, anyone can be great. And then they sell mm -hmm. you shoes and all sorts of other stuff. For Apple, it's really my idea about what their moral of the story is, is that the, the weird artist can be successful. And, and so then through in, and so, you know, at an internet marketing event or at an art event or at a film thing, you're going to just see a sea of Apple computers because they bought that story, you know? Mm -hmm. it, and so, so you start with that, like, what is the punchline? What is the transformation? What is the point of what you're doing and why and what people are going to get? Mm -hmm. And then you build from there. Okay. So I usually, I do use the hero's journey, which is, which is a, a 12 phase journey that we see in every movie and every book I'll I'll just I'll break it down real simple because I don't want to overcomplicate it I usually mm -hmm. use the first four in a marketing campaign and that's that's essentially the ordinary world so Dorothy before she goes to Oz she's in Kansas ordinary world <laughs> then there's the call it's called the call and it's the call to something greater. It's the call to mm -hmm. go from that ordinary world to that extraordinary world. And then stage three is the refusal of the call. Like, no, I'm not doing it. In Braveheart, we see William Wallace being called to get England out of Scotland. And he goes, hell no, I got this hot wife. I'm hanging out. Like, I'm not going to be bothered with your little war. Right? But then what happens is they kill his wife. And then he's like, I'm pissed. I'm going to get you out of my country, which historically he didn't actually get the English out of Scotland. I found out later, but he did win like one battle or something like that. Anyways, mm -hmm. it was a good movie. So usually to build a really, and then stage four is meeting the mentor. So what most brands do wrong with their storytelling is they make themselves the hero of the story instead of mm. me. And I've even seen story trainings where they tell you to do that. Like, oh, you're some victim and I need to rescue you. I'm your hero. Buy my stuff. But actually, <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. But what it really, yes. what it really is, is you, you make them the hero by showing them. And so the story arc pivots around and rolls out around this idea of the moral. So for me, a lot of times my moral of the story is that your vision is bigger than your fear. And you can do it. You just need the steps or you just need the right community. And, and so you would start with that ordinary world. What does their world look like? What are they struggling with? What are they suffering from? Where are they playing small? How are they holding themselves back? All these things. And you just call it out. You just say, look, like I totally get, you know, A, B, and C. And it doesn't have to be that way. And then basically the second is the call. You identify what their greatness is, what their potential is, what they're being called to do. And I use the archetypes to do this. And then the third phase is the refusal. So then you show through the story arc. And usually the ad for me is kind of phase one and two. And the landing page should always just kind of be the same thing that the ad said. And then in the email sequence, I'll start to move into to three and four where I really show them through story what their resistance is and how it, how through engaging with my brand or my mentorship or my programs, they can move through it. Mm. And basically stage five is, is what's called crossing the threshold. That is what when, when Dorothy goes to Oz and the movie turns into color, that's crossing the threshold in, in the movies. So for me, actually them making a purchasing decision is that crossing the threshold phase? Hmm. 
Mm. And then yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of interesting that you bring up the, the um, turning the movie from black and white into color. That really is an epiphany for people to, to realize, you know, that, Oh, it's dawning, you know? Um, and I, I think that's an important part of the story because I, I don't think story arcs are necessarily what people think they are. They think an arc does this perfect movement and it doesn't, it's, it's more of a biorhythm. It's more fluid than that, at least in my mind. Yeah, the Would you agree journey, with that? The hero's journey is often mapped out on like a wheel. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is that there's a lot of ups and downs and pivot points. And, and also if you follow, like a lot of times, even if you read about screenwriting and best practices, they will say, you don't have to follow this perfectly, but you have to. So some movies might focus on only two parts of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing about it is, is that it is kind of this up and down fluid thing, but it has to go through the hero feeling stuck, taking the actions to become great, starting out ordinary, becoming extraordinary. And where it circles back around is that they then go back to their communities and have a special gift to bring back. So that's, mm. so that's for me, that's the program delivery piece of the story funnel. Um, it, and, and that's called, so the, so some people break it down into preparation for the journey, the journey, and then the return. So the return is something that most people in marketing totally ignore, but in Hollywood, they don't. That's as much mm. of, like, you'll see after they slay the dragon or after they, you know, do this, this, and this, then they have new tests and challenges usually as they go back to their community. But once they go back to their community, they've earned the right to bring a special gift back. Mm. That's the completion of, of the story. And if we use this in our marketing, I mean, people can't, I don't know if you've ever been around, like Ben watching a movie and someone just turned it off or someone just like totally interrupted it and you get like real irritated. So that's because most like our DNA, this hero's journey is, is coded in our DNA and it's what we're doing all the time. And so we were like this with it. We're like, what's going to, you know, even though I've seen the same movie 5 million times, you know, <laughs> Star Wars is still grossing a billion dollars in 48 hours because people are like, this is what, this is who we are. And this is what our lives are about in some ways. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we can't help but wanting to see it. So when you, when you take the complexity and actually really the simplicity of the one story that's being told over and over and over again in all our lives. And you just put it into a marketing funnel. People, you won't be in those 5,000 marketing messages that nobody cares about. They, mm. they can't even help it. They're just like, what <laughs> happens next? I need to know. My emails have on average a 30 to 60% open rate because, because they're like, cause, because it's an ongoing story. It's like, it's not just a campaign specific. Oh, by the way, my friend's doing a launch. You should, you know, like you should open my email. It's like, now I'm telling you the next part of the story. And, and, and I have people that read every single one of them and write me back because I know what the story arc is. I took the time to map it out and I'm giving them, I'm giving them, I'm holding up a mirror to their own hero's journey. Mm. And so it's about them and it's not about me. So I think generosity is key. Uh, the generosity to be willing to share your own story in, the, in order to hold that mirror up for them to be the best version of themselves. That's, that's what wins in empowerment marketing, in my opinion. Mm, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think generosity is something that we often overlook. Uh, you know, that it, the more you share, you know, it, it's the whole Burger King thing, right? You know, they didn't want to share that special sauce, but they did. And we know we can't make the exact same product. So we can take all of the lessons that you share one by one, piece by piece, and try to put it all together. But maybe we can't really duplicate that exact secret sauce. Mm -hmm. So giving away that information and being generous with sharing that information doesn't really hurt you. Mm -hmm. It actually helps you because it starts to build a relationship and, mm -hmm. and pull that tribe together. And that's really where marketing is um, 
really where marketing is going now. Um, David mentions in the chat that he says online marketers don't talk about the return because they don't believe the return will ever happen. Uh, they want immediate gratification. That, that, that there, there could be some truth there, but here's the thing. People do want immediate gratification. And even in this kind of marketing, uh, we should give them that. We should give them the satisfaction of, of experiencing a certain emotion. But mm -hmm. it should not be fear. That's my point. And then the return for me is really not something you're going to put in your marketing story as much as you're going to. For me, the story arc and the story funnel continues after they purchase, while they're in your program, through the upsell sequence. So. So what I like to do with it is I like to that part of the story is a more lived experience than it is me just blah, blah, and, you know, in my marketing funnel. It's really about the transformation that's happening when people are inside of my programs and then and then what what they do after that. So I never consider even when I was doing funnels without really doing them this way, I always considered that the post purchase process and the program delivery was part of the funnel. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't think about it that way they think once we have the money then we just need to go get new leads you know and like and so for me the story arc has to continue all the way through and but i don't you know and i'm not here to bash like how other people do marketing either because because everything that's happened before now just got us to where we are and it gives us the opportunity to have a better more inspiring conversation if we want to and what other people are doing you know, if other people are buying that, then other people are, but then they're creating a market for it. And so that's not, that's just not my style of communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, for me, it's yes, a lot of different types of marketing work spray and pray, yell and sell, <laughs> just <laughs> grabbing leads and, and filling the funnel until you're blue in the face. That does work, but it's not how I want to work. And that's the difference for me is that I want to have a relationship with my clients. I want to be able to feel like I've added value to them. And if I don't, I really feel like I haven't done my job. Yeah, not, so, you know, it, it is about generosity and compassion together. Yeah. And you know, for those of you that maybe didn't hear the beginning of the story or jumped on later kind of thinking, yeah, like this can't really work. The first time that I really, I reverse engineered this process. I, we were flying by the seat of our pants and we intuitively launched this program and we use these principles without really knowing it. And we sold $410,000 programs to only 50 of them were to warm traffic. 350 of them were to cold traffic and we sold them in 30 countries. And we did that mm -hmm. within the span of, it was two launches. So it was in the span of, I think 12 or 15 months, but, but only having like those launch periods open during certain times of the year. And we were selling to 21 year olds in Panama. We were selling to people in Qatar and Dubai and you know, all these other countries where people don't have that kind of money to just throw around. And well in Dubai they do, but but like but like <laughs> South America and India mm. and all these other places, they were just so inspired by the marketing that they that they wanted to be a part of it. And so it actually it worked to high ticket cold traffic. So in, in terms of immediate gratification or immediate results, like you can get immediate results, you can make a choice and you can do this or you can do a million other things and you can probably still get immediate short term results. But in terms of long term results, this is probably more sustainable. I see a lot of people come online, make a lot of money and they take such a reputational hit that they 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 don't have a long term sustainable business. A lot yeah. of us are up against the fact that we're not selling a quote unquote product. We're selling ourselves. So we have to do what's really congruent and aligned in terms of who we are as a person too. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I, I, it's just a different approach. It doesn't mean that all the other approaches are wrong. No, I'm not being, but, and I, I, yeah. no, not at all. Like I respect people that, do what feels right to them and do it successfully, you know, and, and direct response feels really good to some people. It's not my personal way of doing things. That's all. Mm, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. I, I really 
have enjoyed this conversation and I'm going to have to go back and make a list of the books that you shared because there's a whole bunch of amazing information there. And I really appreciate it. Kyla. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Hopefully people took something actionable and they can, they can start to tell stories. I hope so too. And I did share your URL in the chat, but why don't you tell people how they can find you and, and get in touch if they want to learn more. Sure, I'm on Facebook. And then my website is kylieslavic.com and, and I'm sure she can spell it for you on the on the blog post or whichever. But I do I do have a lot of content on my site that's free that you might like to look at and learn more about story funneling. <laughs> <laughs> and the link to Kylie's website is also on the blog post on mindfulsocialmarketing.com and you can go there to watch the replay. We'll put this on YouTube and Facebook. It'll be on Spreaker and iHeartRadio. So there's lots of ways that you can listen to this or watch it again. And again, I just, I really thank you for your insights. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you.